Yeah, so I'm Ulrich Hoffmann and I'm talking about fuzzing fours. My initial thoughts on uh, how to apply fuzz tests to fours and uh, all the um, language and all the terms that are so surrounding this idea. And um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that uh, we uh, talked about bounce checks and uh, uh, buffer overflows already because that's uh, something uh, that um, uh, fuzzing actually tries to achieve, make uh, applications robust so, so that uh, regardless of uh, how you use them, uh, they will never crash. So uh, uh, that's the aim at least, and we will see um, uh, uh, what we can do. So my talk will be about lots of different things. Uh, we'll give a short introduction, then we talk about yeah, what do we think uh, about when we say some programs are correct? What are the standard notions and what uh, is the idea that people uh, follow if they want to uh, do fuzzing and uh, make uh, their uh, applications reliable and robust? And uh, then uh, we will look at uh, the building blocks of uh, what we need to do to actually do fast tests. Um, well, the general idea is um, you have your application and it has interfaces and um, you bomb uh, the interface with arbitrary data, not just the one that has been specified and the ones where you know it works, but with arbitrary data and see if the application breaks. And um, uh, if, if it does, then you have to do some homework and uh, see why this happens. Uh, and typically these tests will discover some flaws in uh, your application code um, and show that, uh, well, some invalid data actually make it crash, uh, 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 although you didn't intend to, this to be. Um, yeah, well, so uh, we will see how can we create arbitrary data uh, that we can use to um, test uh, our application. So we will look at generators that will generate arbitrary data. We will look at mutators that will take uh, existing data and modify it appropriately and um, then uh, uh, use this as the input uh, for the application. Um, well, we're in the area where we uh, try an application uh, that typically without further ado will crash. As Nick explained, uh, yeah, it's, it's something is considered to be a fatal error. Uh, a good engineered system will do a restart, make a graceful degradation, lock the error and restart appropriately. Um, but uh, it would be, of course, a better behavior if it wouldn't crash at all, but just lock the error and then continue to work. Um, so. Uh, if we have systems that crash, uh, at least for testing, uh, we would like to make them not crash, but uh, report errors. And uh, uh, this is what sanitizers are about. Uh, it uh, tries to um, check for any strange situation and then uh, report errors instead of crashing. So we look at tests, how we do tests uh, in force, and uh, then finally we come to fuzzing or the initial idea of fuzzing. I wish I could present a fuzzing framework uh, to test force work, words with it or force applications with it, but that's something that we will see in uh, somewhere in the future. I can just present my ideas here. Uh, now that we have all the building blocks, uh, they need to work and uh, the, the path is clear, I guess, and we, uh, after the talk you will um, know what to do on your own, but um, uh, there, there is no library, a fuzzing library that you can use and uh, start working on it. Um, but uh, with the ideas you can go ahead and if you have an application that you want to fuzz, uh, create appropriate words uh, to do so. Um, yeah, finally, we have the conclusion. So it's, I will explain things in a general term, but uh, they all will be applied uh, or, or applicable to force. And uh, that, so let's uh, let's see how this works. So I have to click here. Okay. Yeah. 
So uh, what we really want to do with fuzzing, in addition to the, all the tests and all the quality assurance uh, measures that we do, uh, we uh, want to further increase the quality uh, of applications by automatically testing. Um, yeah, we do uh, testing normally manually. Um, uh, yeah, the engineer gets uh, the system on his desk, uh, has test equipment, and then tries out different things. Well, this, uh, especially with embedded systems, you do this because there's this environment that the uh, control system has to deal with, which is very difficult to emulate. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you do the appropriate tests, um, uh, set up the environment, do the test, and see what uh, the outcome actually is. This is really time consuming. And so, the reason uh, that's the reason why uh, we strive to automate these tests. Yeah, and uh, uh, I, I just had a thesis uh, where uh, some driver assistance systems uh, 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 is automatically tested uh, in, uh, in a uh, test station uh, to uh, reduce the time that the engineer spent uh, doing uh, uh, switch on, switch off tests, for example. So, um, yeah, so you do automatically tests and uh, uh, you test for correct functions. If you change something, you can do regression tests. You know all this. Uh, and uh, you can even uh, uh, focus your, on your entire uh, development strategy on test-driven development and um, put the tests at the center of your development and then uh, develop the programs around them. Um, what we normally do is we mostly test the good cases. So given this input, then uh, the system should behave like that. And we test that uh, the, the appropriate uh, behavior is, uh, is achieved. Infrequently, we test uh, what happens with bad input. In bad situation, does the system really graceful degrade, degrade or uh, does it show errors, um, which, of course, these tests are necessary to do um, to uh, get a high quality. With fast tests, you put on top of this, yeah, you, you do automated tests and uh, sti stimulate uh, your program, your application with arbitrary data, legal or illegal data, uh, and try to break it. Yeah? And uh, this is uh, like the philosophy, crash often, crash early, but automated. Yeah? So you have a program or, or some environment uh, around it that uh, tries to uh, actually uh, uh, break your application. And yeah, yeah and uh, ho hopefully you have some insight from it and know where, where it crashed and um, then uh, be able to eliminate uh, the, the cause. So let's talk about uh, what is correct in, in, the first, uh, in the first place. So what is a correct word? Um, somehow we need to describe the behavior of, of a word. And um, uh, one approach uh, uh, that you can use is um, that a, a word does a state transition from some current state to some next state. Uh, and uh, uh, this could be either deterministic, so the next state is completely defined, there is only one, or it could be a set of uh, next states uh, that are valid. Uh, uh, so. And that's a very typical way to describe uh, the behavior of systems uh, at all. And we can use it for uh, describing the behavior of force systems as well. So states uh, can be complicated. Uh, we all probably know about finite state machines. And there, the states are just enumerations. So they're just labels, and they uh, uh, have an identity and you, trans tra you do your transitions from one identity, one state to another. Uh, the states I'm talking here are not just labels, they are uh, complicated. Uh, it could be the force system state, which includes uh, the stack the, uh, and the return stack content, uh, all of the dictionary with all the variables and all the local variables and uh, uh, the exception stack or what have you. Um, uh, or the existing definitions, uh, this could all make up the state. Uh, so, um, or it could be the computer state. So then you add to the force state, you add the contents of all the files stored on the computer and the memory content of other processes or, uh, and whatever. So it could be really complicated and uh, huge. 
Um, but the idea is uh, my program has an effect on, uh, on the force system or it has effect on the computer state or on the computer. So it actually goes from one state to uh, another state. Or it could be the environment state. So we, we add the world. Um, so uh, depending on the embedded system, there is some relevant part of the world uh, that the system influences and we will um, um, yeah, take this into account as well. So you can think of the states as huge records or uh, if you're a machine learning type, uh, uh, very huge vectors. Yeah, where the components are different parts of uh, what needs to be represented um, uh, of uh, the overall system that is there. And so, um, yeah, we have uh, states and um, uh, we, somehow we want to describe them. And it would be very difficult to um, explain the state with all the content of memory uh, uh, and all the stack content and uh, what have you. Um, so, uh, and, uh, you do it in a different way because also you want not to describe single states, but sets of states, sets of, um, uh, valid states, for example. And, um, the idea here is, uh, you describe sets of states and by this also single states, which are just one element sets by a condition. And, uh, so it's the set of all states that satisfy the condition. Yeah. Um, and uh, this uh, goes then to the, the idea that you have state transitions, uh, like a word goes from uh, current state to the next state. And mm, uh, many aspects of a state are not relevant to the transition. So they just stay the same and we only specify the things that change. Yeah? And uh, we describe a state transition by two conditions. One that describes the set of uh, states that are valid starting points and one that are the resulting uh, states uh, that are there. And these conditions uh, by uh, the invention of Tony Hall are called preconditions and postconditions. Yeah, so we have some condition that uh, must be satisfied so that a word can work. And if it works, then uh, it will establish uh, a state that satisfies uh, the post condition. And with these uh, uh, ideas, uh, Tony Hall de uh, defined uh, correctness notions that we come in into a, a moment. We do this in force uh, also. We do stack comments, for example. We describe conditions uh, in stack comments, like we have zero less than I learned. Uh, yeah, uh, which takes a natural number from the stack and uh, returns a flag on the stack after after working. So n is the condition that toss is a natural number. Yeah, in the current state, uh, minus minus symbolizes the transition, and flag is the condition that toss is uh, 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 a cell with all bits set be true or with all bits reset a false. So uh, uh, a flag in the next state. Yeah. So the, the uh, stack changes from uh, a natural number to a uh, to a flag. The stack effect is not sufficient to describe the behavior of a word completely. There are other words like zero greater than that share the same stack effect, uh, but have a completely different behavior. Yeah. But uh, so if 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 you want to describe the behavior uh, more closely. Uh, what you need to do is uh, you have uh, to strengthen the post stack condition. So it's not that you would have flag here, which just says either true or false, but you have to specify exactly what will be, uh, uh, when will it be true in which case and when will it be false. So a possible stronger post condition would be uh, if toss, uh, uh, toss prime is true. Toss prime is uh, the uh, top of stake after uh, the operation at, in, in the next state. And it's true if toss, uh, uh, the original one in the current state is uh, less than zero. And it turns out false if uh, it's greater, uh, it used to be greater or equal. Yeah. And with so, so if we had a post condition like that, that would describe zero less than uh, uh, precisely. Um, 
With the appropriate pre and post conditions, we can describe the behavior of a word as precisely as we want. And um, uh, it might be very difficult to specify. So uh, yeah, but uh, that's uh, the idea. So, and um, with this idea of pre and post conditions, we can uh, de uh, define uh, the correctness notions, partial correctness, uh, which means uh, uh, if uh, a word starts in uh, a state that satisfies the precondition, and if the word term terminates, uh, means it doesn't crash, it returns a regular result, um, then uh, the next state that the word produces or the transitions to uh, satisfies the post condition. Yeah? Uh, partial correctness means that the word uh, can crash and then it's still partial correct. Uh, there's no guarantee that it will actually deliver a result, which means a word that crashes immediately uh, will uh, always be partial correct. Yeah, M maybe not uh, what you intend to, uh, to have. Um, the uh, backside is if the current state does not satisfy the precondition, then it's out of, uh, it, the word is used out of its specification, the next state is completely undefined. Well, it's in, in standard terms, we say it's an ambiguous condition. Yeah, we don't know what happens. Uh, it could uh, put something on the stack and um, um, pretend that it's a correct result. It could crash, it could corrupt the memory at some other area or whatever. And because of them, these many different behaviors that uh, the word actually could do, um, the computer science often uh, uh, model this as the program does not terminate. It, it, it just doesn't deliver a result or it delivers some arbitrary result. These are uh, ways uh, that, that you could do. Mm, for embedded systems, the total correctness is much more interesting and uh, it's very similar, but uh, uh, it uh, requires that uh, the word actually always gives a good result. It never crashes when used in the in a state where the precondition holds. Yeah? And uh, because it never terminates, uh, it, it always terminates in that case, um, uh, uh, it will then deliver a result and the result will always uh, be in a, uh, a state that uh, satisfies the post condition. Um, and um, uh, Again, if you use the word out of its uh, uh, definition set, uh, uh, yeah, so the, the um, condition P doesn't hold, um, then the state is undefined. So the word can do anything, yeah? So what we want towards fuzzing is actually robust words, yeah? A, a word is robust uh, with respect to a pre and post condition if it always does a transition to a next state, it never crashes. Um, and uh, it is totally correct with respect to a P and Q. So it, it works correctly. Um, uh, but uh, if you um, uh, invoke the word out of P, uh, outside P, when P doesn't hold, then it uh, will not crash, but it will, uh, um, signal an error uh, in an appropriate way. Uh, this could be either throw an exception, return a distinct error value, lock something, uh, and uh, use some substitution value or whatever. Yeah. Um, so fuzzing really uh, will find out uh, uh, if the top level words that you use in your application, if they are robust words. So, because if they are robust, then you always get a, a reasonable uh, non-crashing behavior, and so the entire application could not crash. The inside words could be uh, could be different, yeah, but we will uh, see how how this works. So, fuzzing checks uh, that if an application uh, that means its top level words are robust. So, so if you look at an application, then uh, it has some interfaces from the outside where the user uh, uh, accesses this, uh, either user interface or sensor input or whatever. And there are top level words that actually deal with this. Uh, and these invoke other words, uh, maybe access hardware later on. The internal words 
while they could be uh, just totally correct, uh, that's fine. Uh, but the top level words, they should be robust. So whatever you do on the interface, it, the, the faces, the application will never crash. Yeah, and that's uh, what uh, fuzzing will actually try out. It will uh, stimulate this with arbitrary values and then see uh, whether you can crash the word, uh, uh, yeah, the word that you invoke, which is the top level word or this type of top level word. Um, and all the intermediate words uh, can make errors, but uh, it's responsibility of the top level word to make sure that uh, the system doesn't crash. So um, we have random data uh, because we want to stimulate uh, random values at the interfaces uh, or essentially call, if we don't have the complete system running, but you're during development and test, then you would uh, um, uh, invoke the top level words from the outer interpreter or some program. Um, you have generators and mutators uh, to uh, get random data and uh, to make sure that uh, the top level words uh, uh, will not crash but will report errors, um, uh, we will look at sanitizers. So uh, of course you should program your top level word in a way that it checks all um, uh, um, strange and bad situations and uh, behave appropriately. It should not crash, uh, but for the test purposes, you want it, if it would crash, it should report an error. So we modify the top level word so that it uses sanitizers um, uh, so that at least for testing, it will report and not crash. Because if you have a system that crashes, then it's very hard to monitor. Uh, uh, it, it could not even say where it crashed or where the uh, uh, error was detected. Uh, or you only see it reboots, and that's not really helpful. So, so uh, that's the reason for sanitizer. Well, we will have a look at this uh, bounce checks and uh, stack depth checks and things like this, or memory protection checks. Uh, these are sanitizer. But let's look at gen uh, generators first. So we need to generate random stack items. Yeah, and uh, this means uh, we want uh, uh, random numbers in uh, or random values in different distributions, even distribution, but also normal distribution or other distributions uh, that uh, would be reasonable. So, and then you go ahead and, well, you remember, ah, there was this simple random number generator in starting force. Let's go ahead, uh, linear congruence generator. Well, it go does most things uh, and it's quite okay for, um, well, the, the small computer game that you uh, uh, write in starting force. Um, uh, but um, if you want to create uh, normal distribution from it, well, then it's not so good. Uh, linear congruence generators have a, a cycle, uh, a long, maybe a long cycle, but they show uh, dependencies between the generated values uh, at uh, very low dimensions. So. Uh, if you um, uh, do um, analysis and uh, uh, check the dependencies of um, values 10 numbers apart, then they show uh, a correlation, which is not good. Uh, and uh, there's a big warning uh, if you want to use uh, some uh, uh, algorithms for creating normal distributed uh, um, random numbers from, from these. Um, so I looked into uh, what you can do, and uh, there are KISS generators, uh, and uh, they are very simple, and they have much better properties. And um, there is uh, the um, uh, the JKIS uh, implementation by the D David Jones, I guess uh, is his name, uh, um, uh, that uses explicitly only 32-bit arithmetic. Many of the KISS generators use floating-point arithmetic. They are not good if you are just have a single uh, number um, for system. So uh, JKIS uses 32-bit arithmetic, and it passes all the die-hard tests and big crunch tests. Uh, these are tests that uh, statistically analyze the generated numbers and see if there are some correlations between them. Um, and this is just uh, uh, the implementation uh, that I uh, uh, converted from the C implementation one-to-one -one 
without further thinking of whether this is nice or not. Um, and uh, KISS will just give you uh, an arbitrary uh, new 32-bit number. And then you can choose, use choose as before to create numbers in a certain range. So, and if we, um, yeah, if we have even distribution, we now also might want to have normal distribution, some random numbers around a center value, so, so to diverge a little bit to the left and right, and the farther you go, uh, the less uh, likely will the numbers be. And there is the rule of 12 uh, that you can use. Uh, many of the algorithms like Massalia or Boxmuller uh, transform require floating point to create a normal distribution from uh, even distributed random numbers. Um, but the rule of 12 is very easy to program. It's just sum up 12 numbers, uh, this, the next 12 random numbers, and divide by 12. So that's easy, uh, uh, but there's a big uh, sign of alert if you look at the algorithm it's slow and you should not use it with co uh, linear congruence uh, uh, random number generators uh, but since we're using KISS well nice uh, we can use it to generate uh, normal distributed numbers right um, so now we can do normal distributed numbers and then uh, well we actually want to generate um, random data uh, so, but we can use choose and normal to um, create uh, generators for typical fourth data. Now, like cell data on the stack, maybe a character on the stack, uh, then we say 20, uh, 256 choose. Well, this is even distributed, but you can use it for normal distribution, or you can multiply to change the variance or, or whatever. Um, uh, to uh, change different shaped random numbers. Uh, you can create natural numbers um, where you just say, okay, please uh, uh, take some bit pattern and uh, it will be uh, interpreted as uh, a, a signed number anyways, um, or oh, a signed number. Um, or we could use a, a natural number if we uh, just create the appropriate range and make sure it's always positive. Or we could just uh, use the same definition as ngen for ugen, generate an unsigned number because it will just be, it's a bit pattern will, that will be interpreted as an uh, unsigned number later on. Or we might want to generate strings uh, with a given exact length or a maximal length. Uh, so uh, here we see xgen generates a character and string with uh, exact length uh, takes the length of the string and generates a, a random string or a string gen takes a length on on the stack and generates a string that is uh, at most uh, of that length um, yeah and uh, while these uh, generators allocate memory so later you have to free it uh, uh, if uh, this is necessary but you do it for the tests uh, so um, you uh, generate the, num the data, uh, you run the test, and then you free the data. So that's uh, probably quite easy. So uh, if you have uh, more complicated data structures, which you probably have, um, then uh, like structs or arrays or linked lists, then you use these building blocks um, to uh, recursively define uh, appropriate generators for your, your uh, data structures, like person gen generates an arbitrary person yeah, and maybe you just don't want to have arbitrary characters, but you have a collection of names that you want to compose, um, and you can use choose to index into some uh, predefined table of uh, names or, or whatever. So anyway, you can define some uh, generators for also the structure data. The mutators are quite similar uh, to generators, uh, but they don't create data from scratch they go ahead, take some data that you already have and change it in a slightly, uh, in a slightly way, uh, in a slight way. Um, so you have maybe you have a character mutator that takes a character and some change rate and then uh, uh, returns another character that is maybe close by. If the rate is small, then uh, the uh, divergence uh, of character one and character two is not too much. And yeah, and the other ones uh, work uh, more or less the same. Or you have string mutators 
those that keep the length of the string and just change the characters, or um, you have uh, those that also change the length of the string and uh, give you some other character that is similar. Maybe uh, the rate uh, has something to do with uh, the Levenstein distance uh, of uh, the string before and after, so you can have slightly different uh, strings uh, and see if uh, using a slightly different string or a slightly longer string will actually break your application. Yeah. And um, yep. again, if you have uh, structures, arrays, or linked lists, uh, uh, composed data structures, you would go ahead and uh, uh, define the appropriate mutators uh, based on the primitive mutators that you, that you have. Right. And uh, so now we can generate random data. And now uh, what we need to do is uh, make our application not crash, uh, but report in that case. The original application will crash, and that's what we want to detect. Um, so uh, in the end, we need to uh, change it in a way that it wouldn't crash uh, anymore. But uh, for uh, the fuzzing, we really want the application to detect an error and report it instead of crashing uh, and best report where the error was and what caused it and so on. Mm, so, uh, yeah, we want to turn crashes into reported errors and that's what sanitizers are about. They check if the input uh, or the state is valid. Uh, yeah, and uh, then uh, instead of continuing, uh, report an error. And we have different kinds of sanitizers, memory sanitizers, for example, they de detect illegal memory access. Yeah, and if they find it, they throw memory fault errors yeah, or signal memory fault errors. If uh, uh, you have stack sanitizers that detect stack overflow and underflow, um, and maybe control flow sanitizers that check valid return addresses on exit. Uh, so if you, uh, 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 in some case, uh, uh, leave a value on the return stack and do an exit, uh, instead of crashing the program, it will just signal, well, something went wrong in, in this respect. And there are four systems that actually can do that uh, out of the box. Um, but um, for a general application, we will just uh, add on that. So um, let's see, uh, how can uh, we uh, have memory sanitizers? Uh, what we need to do is we need to, well, uh, modify or redefine the memory operator, fetch store, c fetch c store, or the kind of value, uh, uh, primitive access words or whatever, um, with uh, uh, definitions that do, uh, a test uh, to check if the memory is valid and throw a memory fault on invalid addresses. If you have hardware that can already do this, well, fine, then you don't need it. You can keep it in the application because, because it doesn't cost time. The sanitizers are extremely expensive in performance time, yeah, but um, they are not used in the uh, product in the end. They are just used during fuzzing tests and um, of course, you have to see and balance uh, whether or not it's reasonable that the application runs more slowly. If it's a real-time application, that might not be possible. But yeah, uh, all these uh, things need to be considered. Um, what you can do to detect uh, uh, if a memory is valid, uh, you could use hardware if you can, uh, or you have a linked list of valid memory regions that you check on each access and, and see if the address is in one of the regions, and then that's fine. Um, or otherwise, it's an error. Or you have a bit field of uh, valid memory words, and then you check you know, whether the uh, bit uh, is appropriately set um, for, for the valid things. So um, there is supposedly some word valid that can check whether a memory uh, uh, address is valid or not and then you redefine fetch and store, and then after that you load your application, it uses fetch and store, and um, uh, then uh, those are sanitized. Um, yeah. uh, I know other systems like GeForce uh, 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 does it with uh, Unix uh, memory protection, um, so the, there you normally don't need to do these kinds of things. Um, right, a stack sanitizer. Um, yeah, it detects stack underflow, and um, so uh, if there are not enough arguments on the stack, then uh, you would 
uh, instead of just grabbing somewhere below the uh, bottom of the stack and get whatever is there, you, you would signal an error. And there's this nice word arguments that we had in Volksforce like uh, 30 somewhat years ago already, uh, where you just say XXX arguments, uh, and then uh, it checks whether there are enough arguments on the stack. Um, of course, if you use this inside some inner word, uh, then uh, they have probably put other items on the stack, so there are typically always enough words. So these are only good at the top level words, but yeah, hey, we only want to check the top level words. Uh, so that, uh, that is fine. Um, so, uh, but uh, also um, uh, in the end, you, you might consume too much items from the stack and then uh, uh, run into uh, an, an arguments that shows an error. So if you have swap, for example, um, then uh, uh, if it gets no argument, you just go to your favorite force system and uh, type in swap at the top level without any items on the stack. And then it might just swap something and you don't know what uh, below the stack. Um, you can sanitize it if you say two arguments swap and then you redefine swap as before. Mm. We don't just want to uh, sanitize underflows, but also overflows, but I think this is much harder to do. Um, then you have to have a check on every pushes uh, that the force system does. And this really might need hardware support to do it. Yeah, but then uh, maybe uh, you have a concurrent task that checks some overflow area uh, of the stack. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, uh, so you can uh, uh, imagine what's, what is possible there. Um, and control flow sanitizers, you could check for the valid return address on exit. So also you redefine exit uh, to uh, uh, check for the uh, item on top of the stack. And if it's an invalid address, then it just throws an exception. Um, so that would be possible. Obviously non-standard code because it addresses uh, the return stack in a way where uh, you hadn't put it uh, appropriately with kernel knowledge of a return stack that is used. But um, yeah, well, nobody says that the sanitizers uh, will supposedly be uh, system independent. They are probably highly system specific uh, because they need kernel knowledge of what's going on anyways. So um, yeah, just an example. Uh, you could check the exception stack and other parts of the state um, to see uh, uh, if uh, the state transitions that the words do when executing will lead to some uh, yeah, illegal situation and then report the error instead of crashing. Right, so if we ha have uh, generators, mutators, sanitizers, uh, then let's reconsider how we do tests. We already had this discussion. The typical uh, frameworks that we use for testing are derived from John Hayes' uh, tester uh, that he used for uh, the core un uh, UNS force, core force uh, uh, 94 uh, core uh, tests, but the, the framework is also used for, for application testing in general. And uh, uh, well, actually we check partial or total correctness of the words that we have. So in this case, uh, we test plus here on a single value. And uh, we know if we put three and four on the stack, then the result will actually be seven, which says very little about plus. There are many, many, many functions that uh, are words that satisfy this. Um, uh, and uh, especially if you have powers of two, then uh, or and plus uh, behave the same. Um, and uh, so you need to have uh, lots of tests uh, and typically do corner case uh, uh, analysis. Think where are the uh, areas of the states uh, that will be likely to cause errors and then you test it. But yeah, we can do it and it's very helpful if you do test driven development, have lots of these tests, uh, that's really great. Uh, and we can build large test suites uh, from this. Uh, Jerry Jackson did this for 2000X compliance, for example, so which is very helpful uh, to get implementation, uh, uh, the idea whether or not they comply to the standard. Mm. So, and with fuzzing, uh, what we want to do, uh, if we want to fuzz an application, 
of course, what we first do is we do okay, Hayes style unit tests uh, and to detect any bugs where the program misbehaves on ordinary expected input. Um, the fuzzing is only for finding errors in, uh, uh, in the bad data, not in the good data. So, um, so we need to fix all the bugs. So all the, the, the traditional tests have to run through and uh, be successful. And then we look at the top level words and uh, we use, uh, uh, we define them in a way that they use sanitizers. So they will not crash, but they will report their errors. And then uh, we run the test unit, uh, uh, the Haystyle uh, tests again, to see whether our wrapping uh, and using of the sanitizers cause any issues on that. Yeah, if it misbehaves, yeah, well, then uh, maybe the sanitizers have some issues or, or whatever, and then we have to hunt this. Uh, but if this is, a, no issues are expected, but if they show up, then we need to fix them. And then we run the tests, uh, the fast tests in this style, uh, assuming we have some word uh, TLW, top level word, uh, that takes two strings and returns a new string, uh, which is a typical user interface word, uh, which could be a file or a username and a password and an access token that is returned. Or, um, yeah, so, uh, and many times we just uh, do this, we take some data uh, uh, that we generate, uh, a string of length uh, uh, of uh, maximum length 100, then a uh, string that is a derivation of uh, the word secret, and we parse it into the top level word. We are not interested in the result that it uh, gives. Uh, yeah, it, that it gives the correct result on proper input, uh, we check with the Hayes style test already. We are only interested whether or not it crashes uh, and it should raise uh, an error, uh, yeah, most likely uh, using the throw mechanism. So we can just clear the stack uh, and say, well, uh, if uh, uh, it should do nothing. So in the end, uh, there shouldn't be any items on the stack. And if it raises an, an errors at some uh, invocation with some arbitrary data, well, then we know where, where uh, because we can see the uh, hopefully, in the system uh, we have, uh, we can see the stack trace and see where where the issues actually are. So, yeah, that's uh, that's the idea. And uh, more of concrete fast tests I can probably show you next year or next time we meet. Um, um, so this is the rough idea. And um, uh, so let me come to my conclusion. Um, so we look at correctness notions uh, uh, that words uh, can uh, uh, be correct uh, in, in a partial or a, a total uh, way, um, depending whether or not they crash or uh, they always give a result. And we looked at robustness. So whatever you do with a word, it never crashes. We looked at generators and mutators, uh, like uh, we need random gener generators and the rule of 12 to create uh, a normal distribution, uh, mutators to change existing data in a certain way. We looked at sanitizers uh, so that instead of crashing, we uh, report errors uh, in our programs and um, then it tests uh, uh, in the hay style and fuzzing uh, uh, step stressing the top level words, uh, the interface of our application in a long running loop with many, many, many data uh, that um, you know, we use uh, to find out. The research in that area is, well, if you just use random things, then it's very unlikely that you actually find one of the flaws. So there is lots of research going on uh, how you mutate data in a way that it's likely that you will find some flaws in your program. So like in, uh, increasing or using, yeah, mutators are fine because they're using very similar data and then you extend it a little bit and, and longer and longer and longer maybe and somehow you detect the buffer overflow um, uh, and so on. Yeah, but that's something uh, that is uh, open for discussion and open for research uh, to do. So. Thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, Thank you very much, Uli. Let's get to the questions right away. Um, so Glyn has had put his hand up. Glyn, please ask mm -hmm. the first question. Uh, yes, are you aware of QuickCheck? 
it uh, it's a framework for originally for Haskell, which was designed for exactly that kind of smart searching for edge cases that you just described at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I know it was originally only for purely functional languages um, with uh, referential transparency. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think the closure implementation extended it to be uh, to handle side effects as well. And there's an implementation for Factor. I just Googled it while you were talking. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, great. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of it, though. Thank you very much for the pointer. Yeah, uh, quick. And yeah. Um, a quick, quick check. Yeah. And um, yeah, um, w w of course, we need to see how it fits into the fourth, but uh, mm -hmm. looking at the ideas that they have uh, is, is great. So what yeah. I was also looking at is um, the fuzzing support that the Go language actually brings in. Uh, it's uh, right out of, out of the box there. So you have a unit test framework and you have a fuzzing test framework where you say, OK, it's, this is the unit test. And uh, they know about uh, the arguments and the result types uh, because of the language. And then they can mutate uh, on the fly without uh, explicitly programming. So that's quite nice. Yeah, but I will check out quick check. I will quickly check out quick check. And then, um, uh, yeah, we'll see what, what comes out. OK, wonderful. Anton, please ask the next question. Yeah, several comments. So mm -hmm. one is um, connected, probably connected to quick check that was at Carl's uh, Communications Congress a few years ago, um, a talk by Michael Sperber um, about fast testing um, um, in basically he gave a kind of lecture um, uh, on fast testing um, using a functional language, uh, not Haskell, but something similar. And um, so basically what he did there is he didn't test against does it crash or does it run into a sanitizer or something like that, but he, um, he had a, um, a kind of um, specification um, uh, which and, and tested against the specific specification, which uh, is uh, you can also use fast testing for that. Mm -hmm. um, the next point, yeah, there was another talk at that uh, Chaos Communications Congress where they tested, they fast tested the kernel, and this was much more in line what you presented. So it was like if uh, if it runs into a kernel crash, it's uh, it's uh, bad, and if it's uh, if it's caught, it's uh, it's um, we think it's okay. Um, mm -hmm. And finally, the third. Point. Yeah, uh, there's also um, related to to what you said about mutators. Basically, there have been um, for several years uh, some fast testing frameworks which uh, look at what um, branches are performed by um, um, in, internal to the to the fast tested program, and um, if and then it. Uh, tries to uh, to actually go ever deeper and, and mm -hmm. uh, try to uh, exercise branches that haven't been exercised by the fast tests yet. So it it's not just random, it's uh, mm -hmm. random mm -hmm. with some direction. Exactly. But so mm -hmm. so, so there, there, there are different flavors of uh, fast tests. Uh, uh, those uh, that do black boxing, they don't know much about the inner structure. Uh, and there are white box tests that know the program structure. And then, uh, as I said, the research is how to uh, use clever data that uh, explores most of the, the flaws. They look at the branches and they uh, uh, look at the comparisons that are done at the branches. And then they try to uh, generate random numbers or random data that is supposedly uh, uh, trigger one or the other branch. And then they measure the, uh, uh, the coverage and uh, do uh, fuzz data that increases the coverage uh, so so that you you are more likely to actually crash the program by like that yeah okay um, the next one was Andrew and then Nick mm -hmm. Andrew please great thanks thanks very much Julie. I am um, so my question I've got two um, sort of particular cases in mind where I can 
the sort of you know the frustration of things going wrong um, and i'm wondering how fuzz tests could be applied to it i was thinking about that but there's a question so the first one is you've got two systems that work perfectly well thoroughly tested but when you put them together they don't work a recent example to me was the browser that i was using to access this and the webcam that i wanted to show myself with both working fine but i try and use the browser and the webcam together things freeze fail etc so you've got two systems coming together so that's one that's one case we seem to get a lot of problems and then another one is when you have hardware that you you can't really commission until until you get there so maybe something in space and you unfold the web james webb telescope arms and you you, you sort of but you have to simulate that right or, or i don't know is is there some way that fuzz testing can kind of explore these spaces that otherwise you can't mm -hmm. reach until you put systems together or until you launch them into space can fuzz testing get you there earlier you know when you're still in the lab and can, and can resolve these problems mm -hmm. well every test that uh, every fault that is discovered by tests is great yeah because it can be fixed uh, if you're in outer space then well, we know that um, uh, the satellites will have upload functionality so that if you detect uh, errors, you can still fix them even on the mission. Um, right. So, um, yeah, what you typically do with uh, uh, a difficult to simulate environment is that uh, you, you do uh, something that is called MOCs. And uh, uh, in object-oriented languages uh, with inheritance, that's especially easy because you can have some abstract class uh, or some abstract objects uh, that expose an interface and uh, can have different uh, implementations. And one is, uh, is a test implementation um, that behaves similar to the uh, real thing. And maybe it just reads uh, the results from a data file or from an Excel sheet if you want to. And uh, it just knows the first time I'm called, I look, don't look at the uh, at the data. Um, I, I return the first row and then and the second and so on. And uh, this is uh, a, uh, a stimulus uh, for, for the application under test. So, uh, yeah, with even with traditional testing, you do uh, a simulating of the environment. This can be extraordinarily difficult. And, uh, it's really a challenge. Um, and uh, with fuzzing, um, you have to do this, uh, the same thing. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, but uh, you look at how, uh, how your system behaves, whether or not it crashes. But yeah, it might reach out to some other system. And uh, the system must, be, uh, must behave accordingly. I think if you, if you focus on the interfaces and really make the interfaces reliable, then that's uh, that's a big step forward. Okay, gentlemen, I'm sorry, but we're already eating well into our bio break by now. So uh, can I can I ask for a very quick comment or a question by Nick? So and then maybe make this a workshop because it sparked quite a lot of interest. Yeah. Uh, okay, it's just um, um, I think uh, this relates, of course, to my previous paper um, on what I was basically doing was sanitizing. And uh, I don't know what Uli thinks about this. Uh, should I make the index checking and the string length checking optional? And I thought of a really nice new fourth word called query postpone, which compiles the checking if the, uh, if the sanitize flag is on and doesn't do anything if the sanitize flag is off. What do you think of that mm -hmm. one? Yeah, uh, I would say it, it, it depends on the performance. So if, you, if it turns out that uh, when you do it, and you talked a lot about performance uh, and, and looked at this, um, if it's not, not, not too costly, I would leave it in. Um, but if it's, if it's expensive, then uh, you can't ship the product with the ch checks in. Well, then they aid uh, during development. But yeah, the system will crash then uh, 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 yeah, uh, without them. So. Uh, I think it's a, it's a balance, and you can't give a general answer for this. You have to look at it very, very, very uh, carefully, and maybe even p some of them you leave in, and some of them uh, you you want to uh, avoid yes, because they are in the inner loops and very costly. I just thought that query postpone was such a good potential fourth word. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Nice.